Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us at Prince Center New York for tonight's conversation with Juana Estrada Hernandez, Nina Jordan, Jacqueline Stryker, and Eric Otsogo. I'm Robin Siddle, Exhibitions and Programs Coordinator at Print Center New York. Each of these artists joining us tonight have work currently on view in our summer exhibition, New Voices on Transformation. This is the inaugural presentation of our re-envisioned open call program, providing a curator-selected cohort of artists with a platform for their work and support at a pivotal moment in their careers. This year's exhibition was curated by Carmen Ermo, Associate Curator for the Brooklyn Museum Center for Feminist Art. And for the pilot year of New Voices, uh, Ermo encouraged applicants to consider their work in terms of transformation. This could reference, for example, a perspective or expectation, a social or political reality, a traditional process or medium, and encouraged an open-ended reading of the theme. New Voices on Transformation is currently on view at our Chelsea exhibition space, and our summer hours are Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. Before we begin, I have just a quick note about accessibility. Uh, tonight's event has live captioning in English. You can enable captions by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen on desktop or by going into the settings menu on mobile. Uh, tonight's program will also be recorded and available on our YouTube account in about a week. Now I'll invite our artists to please join me on screen. Welcome Juana, Nina, Jacqueline, and Erico, and please just say a quick hello so that we know all your voices. Hello, Nina. Hello. Hello, Erico. Hi, this is Juana. Uh, we're really happy to have you all with us and to think about your work tonight through a guided conversation. I'll be prompting you with some questions, but please feel free to ask each other questions and respond to each other's work and ideas throughout the evening. Uh, for folks at home, you can send us questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. I'll take them throughout the night and also reserve some time for them at the end. The public chat will also be open. You can feel free to contribute to the conversation, sharing comments or thoughts that aren't direct questions there, and I'll keep an eye on that too. Uh, finally, a heads up that there will be a super quick survey at the end of the evening, and we really appreciate you sharing your feedback to help us produce better programs. Uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the theme of this show is transformation, but this reveals itself in a myriad of ways for the artists in the show through transformation of materials, history, and identity. Um, for the four of you, one common thing that I noticed in thinking about your work was the idea of home and identity within the home, of safety and belonging. I thought that we could start with each of you taking just a couple minutes to introduce the major ideas of your work with this idea in mind. So we'll start with Nina and then go to Jacqueline, Erico, and Juana. And Nina will have some images of your work up going through in the background and take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, so um, I do uh, woodcut prints, often reduction woodcut prints, and a theme that has gone through my work since I started uh, working is um, housing and habitat and um, housing and habitat vulnerability for um, people and other animals. Um, the pieces that were selected for the show by Carmen are all pieces about um, houses that are being submerged by flood water floodwaters, which is uh, you know, a response obviously to what we're going through and how it related to transformation was uh, the, the, the changes that our um, environment is going through due to our, our, our um, lack of sensitivity um, and our abuse and greed. Um, but anyway, uh, one of the things that Carmen said to me, which was I thought was really interesting, um, she spoke about threshold and at what point is this too much? And she felt that the rising flood waters were a statement about um, at what point do, do, does this stop? Um, what, what is the threshold? What, how much is too much for us? So um, anyway, that, that is my introduction. And the, Oh, and, and here's a here's a, a lake sturgeon, and it's about uh, oh, look at him! 
is an ancient fish, very ancient fish, 150 million years old. They haven't evolved much in 150 million years. And I thought how um, frightening it was that something so old was vulnerable to these very, you know, super fast changes that we are we are creating. And another another flooded home. A smaller one this time. Another flooded home. I think this one was in Florida. And um, I I I pulled these images from from newspaper stories uh, from stories of destruction and homelessness due to floods. I it was very hard working on these pieces. Uh, they're made with found lumber. You can see there are two pieces of board used here. Um, and uh, yeah. I, I, Thanks so much, I, Nina. What? I was just saying thank you for introducing okay. your work and I'm looking forward to getting further into it in just a few minutes. Okay, great. Uh, I think we had a little issue with the chat before. It should be up and running now. If it's not, feel free to pop us another message to the Q&A. But uh, now let's move on to Jack uh, to Jacqueline. Okay. Hi. Um, so uh, yeah. So so my work as it relates to home. Um, uh, you know, my this body of work really for me began in the when my when I had to give up my outside studio space and kind of relocate my practice to my home um, as uh, because because I'd had a child um, and uh, you know just the realities of New York real estate and being able to afford daycare and, and things like that. Um, and, you know, and it's also, you know, I'm looking at, I look as a starting point at objects and patterns that are of the home at um, vintage textiles, tablecloths, washcloths, um, at quilting, vintage quilting patterns, at wallpapers, um, at ornamental tiles, and I draw, I create drawings based on these. And then, um, and then I, and then I take those drawings, scan them and, um, and ultimate and print them as reso prints onto various materials, onto Japanese um, papers and handmade papers and fabric. Um, and then I reconfigure them and, um, collage them and 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 sew them together to create these larger works. So, um, yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Jacqueline. Um, Erica, would you like to tell us some a bit about your work? Hi everyone, my name is Eriko Togo. I'm a Mongolian American multidisciplinary artist. My main mediums are drawing, painting, screen painting, screen printing, installation, and performance. Uh, for this specific series featured at Print Center, this is in continuation of Wrong Woman Miss from Sky series. Um, the series explores the embattled emotional middle space of the marginal person and community as they uh, travel through the kaleidoscopic space of time and um, nature. And um, specifically the four shown at Print Center deal with um, an initial body print. So I'm um, sort of um, mixing a lot of performative elements as well as uh, spiritual um, scribing and kind of channeling my ancestor spirits. And a lot of the forms come from a meditative state. Um, I also practice uh, paradelia, um, which is the surrealist technique of seeing random data, uh, a specific image in random data usually. Um, and so these were using um, a base uh, Japanese chalk. Um, and I was also using a lot of like found relics from um, the, the nature um, of where I was creating the work from. 
and then the forms sort of emerge um, when I sit with them and I go in there and it's a matter of addition and subtraction and the narrative sort of forms um, naturally. Thank you. Great, thank you, Erico. Uh, Juana, would you like to tell us a little bit about your work in in these uh, in these terms? Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Juana Estrada Hernandez, and uh, my artwork artwork, um, you know, both what's in the exhibition, but then my larger body of work, really. Uh, looks critically at my family and I as individual, my own and my family's uh, migration experience, um, specifically uh, taking our uh, histories and oral traditions and sort of reinterpreting them visually um, through print works. Um, the works that are in the exhibition right now um, is a combination of traditional like handmade prints and then, and then some that are uh, a larger installation. Um, but the way that the work um, speaks to the idea of transformation. Um, it's really talking about um, this sort of idea of transformation in like a social and more political perspective of, of what it's like to grow up undocumented in the United States for, for a certain amount of time for not, for, um, not only myself um, and perhaps some of my other family members, but then also like what that looks like um, being as a uh, docu documented person um, and so uh, the work really tapped into, um, of course, like the ident my uh, identity as far as like identifying as like Mexican and like um, and what that what the, that what does that look like in the United States, especially right now, where I feel like uh, the the social and like political like uh, energy around migration is so politicized right now. Um, is it's kind of like. You know, it's hard to 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 not speak about those things where, where perhaps like those directly uh, impact myself and others like right now and um, and so a lot of the images that you see in the work are either like family members or like um, culturally identifying symbols um, where people can say, um, oh perhaps I don't identify with your uh, let's say immigration experience, but perhaps um, these symbols like let's say a food or um, uh, other like culturally like Mexican identifying symbols can like pull you into the conversation so that we can really have like a one to one conversation as opposed to this like larger scope. Um, um, yeah, conversation about uh, Migration. Thank you, Juana, and uh, thank you all for getting us acquainted with your work. I'm really excited to take a deeper dive into some of the ideas that you all have brought up in your introductions already. Um, in your practices, I see a lot of ways of reusing, transforming, altering source materials, um, dealing with ideas and processes involving fragmentation and deconstructing and reconstructing materials and ideas. Um, on that note, I wanted to start with um, Juana and Erico going a little further into your work. Um, both of you work a lot with layers and fragmentation in the way that you think about identity and in the way that the imagery is developed in your work. Could you talk a little bit about that process and why this is important in the way that you're making your work? Juana, you alluded to that a little bit in your introduction. Maybe you could speak a little more to that first. Yeah, so um, I think that um, this idea of like, not both not only physically altering materials but thinking about the ways of deconstructing not only like an idea a physical print um reconstructing something through the process of printmaking i think is essential um of course not only to like the making of the art product but i think also because of the uh, of the themes or ideas that i'm talking about um i think that uh Politically speaking, like immigration is it's such a nuanced thing. Everybody has such a different experience with that. Um, but of course, I'm coming into it from my own personal experience of, of what that has looked like through my own individual experience, of course, like my family members and perhaps like, you know, like my um, larger community. Um, but some of the works that you see in the exhibition of, that I feel like are more traditional in the sense that it's like they're they're very carefully layered, you know, they're a traditional lithograph or an etching or things like that. But um, but then there's other pieces like like that larger installation piece where where I, I um, deconstructed uh, physical uh, legal documents 
in 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 paper like that, that came um com that came from like physical just pieces of like eight eight by eleven sheets of paper and then I reconstructed them and reformed them to to I I you know in some ways like it's it's such a hard thing to talk about like hey what what is it how do you talk about being uh, in this larger program of DACA to someone who doesn't understand and um, who doesn't understand that without physically going through it. Um, and so sometimes it's necessary, at least for me in this case, and the, and the work that I made for the installation is like, okay, how do I take something that is intangible to, um, and make it tangible? Um, and through the, and, and so my negotiation was through like making objects, um, but also retaining that sort of really um, vital uh, visual information, right? Like as artists, we we use visual inf information to to communicate ideas and and thoughts and all these things. But um, so for me, uh, this idea of like altering materials sometimes is necessary in order to really push that message forward. Um, whereas like perhaps, um, you know, like how do you how do you make the process of of going through like let's say an immigration procedure um, tangible? Well, like let me show you the real thing. Like let me show you the real documentation. And perhaps like that's that's where it becomes real for someone else who has never been through that experience. Um, but then also too, like um, whether it's like physical objects um, or like more of those traditional prints, I think that like this idea of um, reconstructing or kind of being able to um, stay flexible with like your concepts and ideas through the process is important. I know that sometimes depending on what you're doing in printmaking, it feels like once you have the idea, you put it on the matrix and then you just kind of have to go through it and, and it has to stay like a rigid process. And I actually don't think that way. Most of the time, like even for the works that are like more traditional like these, I, you know, I might transfer an idea, a sketch very loosely, let's say on a stone, but like I just freehand it and just kind of allow it to, to change and morph, even though it feels like it, 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 it can't for some reason. Um, but I think that that's something that really shows up in all of your work actually being really responsive to the processes that you're involving rather than starting with, you know, an image, an idea and executing it, you're all responding in really fluid ways. So thank you for, for bringing that up. I think that's a really um, strong connection between all of you. Um, Erica, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how um, this idea of fragmentation uh, shows up in your work. Absolutely. Um, I just kind of wanted to bring it back to the theme of transformation as well. Um, a lot of my work deals with the notion of home, the longing and the very belonging. And I appreciate you, Juana, for sharing your uh, documented journey. I am also a DACA recipient. And so a lot of my work deals with, you know, the East and the West and this kind of tension that I that I feel in between my two cultures, um, not belonging to either. Um, but also it being a power position because you have dual perspective. Um, and so a lot of my drawings and printmaking uh, deal with uh, depicting this tension through like physical modality. Um, I'm integrating more and more of my performance into my drawings. And so this kind of initial source material that is inherently energy. Um, and then I'm also playing with a lot of automatic and intended mark making. I like to fuse binary concepts and techniques of representation from contrasting languages of wet and dry textures, precision and chaos into a simulatory layer as to sort of create a uh, conceptual proximity between um, uh, forces of opposition and uh, displacement. Um, so for me, it is uh, a, a very planned, um, I do brainstorm with my art, but I'm also learning to have more of like a, a fluidity, a dance um, uh, with the process of how it forms like through a subconscious narrative, as opposed to, um, if you could show actually Robin, like the final slide, American Me, uh, which is the most colorful piece. Um, but this is a, a very, uh, planned piece. And so the background, I'm dealing with a lot of um, constellation points based on um, Tonka, uh, which is a deity art form, Buddhist deities. Um, so all of these kind of refer back to my Mongolian culture, my roots, and I'm using actual um, uh, self-screened actual ornamental patterns. Um, and some of them I also design digitally and um, do as uh, Xerox copies, as well as um, uh, just using different type of chemical solvents and 
chalk transfer as well. I learned this technique from my father. Um, my father's a tanka artist. Um, so I kind of grew up with a lot of um, just oriental uh, art forms that have quite the delicate, you know, patterns and, and richness, and there's a big mythology behind them. Um, but spirituality and um, my culture are like two big things that I always infuse in my work. Thank I was you. wondering also if you could um, speak a little more about something you mentioned in your uh, introduction about finding images in randomness and how that kind of works with um, the other set of prints that are um, in the show with the ones that are starting with a body print and how you're making the decisions to bring images out of those random patterns. Thank you. Um, so this is called Pareidolia, a school of, it's from surrealism. Uh, Dali practiced it as well. You know, you can typically look at a cloud, for example, and see like an animal shape. Um, same with any type of random pattern. Um, I've just had this ability and it's almost like scrying. So reading water or reading the elements. Um, and this is kind of directly in tune with my gods. I, I pray every day. And so it's almost like heightening your intuition in a way. And it's a, a way of connecting to my ancestor spirits, to my roots. And so I initially have a kind of concept, whether it's textual play or something biographical for my life that dictates the piece. But um, I allow myself that space to play and for the narrative to sort of form. I really sat with these pieces for um, a few days and let the forms emerge. Um, and, you know, during that brainstorming time, I'm taking a uh, dream diary um, and a lot of, you know, I'm just in, in a meditative state. So these were done in a more serene environment, I would say, as opposed to um, how I typically work, which is very planned. And like, this is a good example, shadow dance. Um, there's a lot of, you know, push and pull. I'm using kneaded eraser as well as mechanical pencil to sort of go in there and then, you know, highlight some parts, dilute some parts, um, and then going in even with a pen at the very end and sort of criminizing some areas. Um, I did these four ser uh, the series of works at Fountainhead Residency last year in Miami. So a lot of these works have like sea references. Uh, these are sea knots that a lot of sailors use um, and sort of this narrative of like the male and female and this binary conversation just grew. Um, again, this is a continuation of Wrong Woman Myths from Sky, which features a lot of anonymous figures. They don't have a face. Um, they're going through a lot of physical trials to depict emotional turmoil. And the anonymity also speaks to, you know, me being undocumented and sort of um, that whole, the voiceless aspect of things. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Erico. Um, Nina and Jacqueline, I wanted to invite you guys in to talk a little bit about how, um, respond to what Erico and Juana are saying about um, fragmentation and also about how this like responsiveness shows up in your processes. Um, I can go. Oh. Or is Nina going? I think Nina's on mute. Either one. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go. You, you, wanna, you wanna go or I'll, I'll go. go, go I, ahead. I started working with Woodcut um, while working on a, doing a gut rehab on a, a space that I was trying to live in. And there was lots of lumber lying around. And I thought, what can I do with this lumber? And I started um, carving it and printing it. And I, I never thought of myself as actually uh, you know, like making plates. I thought of myself as building an image. And, um, and I, I put the pieces together and I layered them and I, I, I actually let, and I, I'm thinking of Erica, what she just said, um, uh, I actually let the, the wood speak to me and dictate a lot of what I was doing as you would if you were a carpenter and you found a piece of uh, beautiful cherry. You know, the cherry would tell you what it was going to become, like what you wanted to do with this beautiful piece of cherry. And so I'd find these scraps of lumber and I'd build them. And 
put them together. And that's how the images of the homes really made their way into um, the, the, these uh, prints because I, 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 I felt like I was building and I felt like there was a, 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 a direct uh, association between creating a, a home space and, and the, the pieces of lumber and, and, and the sort of the, the uh, uh, vulnerability of these pieces of lumber. They were being thrown out, but then they were being recreated into images of houses that were in distress. And so it was having a lot of um, uh, fun with that. And, and these are three, are, are this, this print is made of three separate planks of wood that I found. And I really felt that they, uh, that these three planks really spoke of the siding. And, and, and to respond to Juana about planning, I've, I've never planned, everybody says, oh, how do you plan that out? I've never planned out a single one of these prints. I just, uh, you know, take out what's lightest. It's the, the reduction. So you start and you just layer the same thing, carve, print, carve, print, carve, print. And I just take out what's lightest and I feel it and I see what happens with the grain of wood. And the grain of wood dictates what happens. And is that an answer to your question, Robert? Okay. Um, Great, I'm absolutely. And thank you for pointing out the um, three pieces of wood in this work, because that was something that I didn't recognize until I saw these works in person. But now I can see these, you know, the lines running through that just sort of blend really well into the composition. So thanks for pointing that out here. Um, Jacqueline, do you wanna um, respond to what you're hearing here? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think, um, like Nina said, uh, you know, also in my work, I, I, nothing is ever planned out. I actually never start with any final composition in mind at all. Um, my, my work is largely rooted in material exploration and process. So, um, you know, I'm starting with these I'm start, you know, I start with these drawings and, um, and, and for me, for a long time, all that I had were the drawings and I didn't know where those were going to go at all. And I was just sort of accumulating these drawings. And then eventually I, I just, I had the opportunity to take, actually take a risograph class. Um, I have a background in printmaking, but I'd never done um, risograph. And that, and that, you know, and I, so I brought my drawings and then I started printing them. And then I had the, and then I started to, and then I was lucky enough to be able to, um, it's not common to print, to put weird materials through a risograph machine. And I was lucky enough to have someone who let me <laughs> run some, run some funky things through before I eventually, acquired my own studio again and my own my own duplicator but um but I even at that point I started to just accumulate these materials that I was making and I always think of my process as like starting with making materials um so I make these you know I draw these patterns and tessellations um and then I print and then I print them and then I just have piles and piles and piles of materials. And even now I have boxes of materials. And then when I start to make a work, I start to um, I start to take them out and and see what I think works together and divide them up. Um, and then I'm cutting them and responding to the shapes that I see in different works. Um, uh, in order to like start to, in order to start to build the larger thing. And sometimes, sometimes there'll be a, like something that I decide I want to incorporate that I kind of find as like a funny moment, like in the one before, uh, notions, there's this pocket in there with a, with a, it's almost like a printed handkerchief that you can see in it. Um, and so I'll, I'll get kind of like, I'll decide, oh, that's going to be a part of the work. Um, uh, and sometimes, you know, as I cut shapes, 
uh, some sort of form uh, that is a little more explicit starts to emerge. Um, as with Dreamhouse, I was working with a lot of these patterns from a crown that I had printed that were based on a crown quilt um, pattern. And as I was cutting the triangles, they started to, you know, I'm thinking about crowns and then the, the triangles started to look to me like the turrets of like, you know, of a castle or a fortress. And I knew I wanted to create this kind of soft dilapidated, um, you know, castle with, with, um, with the, with the materials. And so sometimes some things like that start to emerge, but I never have an idea of where it's going to go when I start. Um, I just have these materials that I've made. And even in this one, um, like something that's a little newer to my work. Um, and this is, this is the, one of the most recent pieces that I've made. It's the most recent work I've made it that's in the show. Um, I have been doing these drawings with a calligraphy pen where I'm just drawing a, with a, a continuous line without looking with a calligraphy pen. Um, and then I turn, and then I, um, in an analog way, turn that into cut it up and then do that again and turn that into an endless repeat. And so you can kind of see that there, but that's not something, you know, that um, shape that it's, it starts as this sort of meditative drawing. It's not something that ever could be planned out. And then when I'm looking at it, I'm seeing what forms I can draw out from that. It's sort of this like, um fractal process like you start you have a drawing and it becomes a bigger thing like you can scale yeah. on all these different levels yeah um, exactly. I also I've just been thinking about how you know a risograph being something that's very similar to a, a copier machine has a very limited format but you're working in a way that really lets you completely ignore that um and then you're also working in a way you have these two-dimensional works but then you move into throwing that away and moving into three-dimensional. So I'm just curious sort of about your um, your process and how you've gone through like each of those layers, like going up to like the next bigger thing. Yeah, um, so I had, you know, started with, I love paper. Um, I love, I, I love like handmade papers and making paper and Japanese papers and just, you know, I have, I, you know, had worked, that was, that's my comfort zone, right? So when I began making these drawings, they were based on fabric, but I, on uh, very much based on quilting patterns and on text and on textiles. Um, and but I was sort of remaking them as the, you know, onto paper, which I also thought had this interesting sense of like, um, of, of um, taking an object that has like a utilitarian purpose and then, and then making it so that it, it definitely like can't be used. And it is like very definite, very definitively an art object or whatever, right? Um, so that was how it all began. And then I thought I started to think, well, wouldn't it be funny to like, wouldn't it be sort of funny to make these onto fabric? <laughs> um, and, and so I started to work um, on fabric as well. Um, and then that sort of naturally, as I was making those, um, when you have a piece of fabric, there's this like inclination to, you know, you can, you can you can fold, you know, you can fold it and um, you can, you can, I think about um, play. I have, um, I have a daughter, she's seven now. When I started making a lot of these works, she was, um, you know, when I, the whole impetus for beginning was like when she was born, but um, a lot of these began when she was about four. Um, and, and, you know, when, a kid will like take a blanket and at one mo moment it's a cape and one moment and another moment it's like a dress or something and then another moment it's 
um, being used to create a um, a fort. Um, and so I love that sense of how something could be activated in that way. And the three-dimensional works um, are, start, are something that like begins to do that. Um, something that I loved seeing in a, have with having like this work in particular installed is how it has these cutouts in it and it's and it's installed so that it is in space um, and you can walk around it and inevitably people like go around it and kind of like stick their head um, through it and take a photo like not through it but respectfully like behind it but so that you can see their head um, and take it someone will take a photo of them and there's there's a there's fun that's happening there that I that I really enjoy so it's really it's really interactive and um calling for a lot of time and attention because you can get so granular looking at them um and we've definitely seen a lot of people in the space doing exactly what you're saying poking their heads through looking at the rest of the gallery from uh through one of those little windows yeah um Juana and Erico, I wanted to return to some ideas that you were bringing up earlier about um, the, the way that you each are working with print. It is uh, indexical in some way. It's an impression of some kind of event on paper. Um, I was wondering if you could each speak about how this appears in your process, and maybe if you're thinking about print as a record or as an archive more broadly. Um, Juan, I was wondering if we could start with you and particularly about some of the ideas you were talking about with your large monotype installation. Maybe you could talk a bit about your process of making those prints. Uh, yeah, so the the installation that's in the space um, it co is composed of two uh, parts. One is a section of like 10 monotype prints um, that Right below it is um, you have six uh, paper gallons, um, and so uh, the way that this this whole installation kind of was put together, because um, like earlier, all of us were talking about like we we have we have this like conceptual idea or these thoughts that that we want to speak to like in the work that we're making, and sometimes we're we're allowing us um allowing ourselves to be flexible with the process like we're kind of reacting to to what is happening or I, I suppose sometimes what is not happening um on on paper or or what we're as we're like working with materials and so um the monotype installation like really like conceptually like this piece was was very much like a reactionary piece to what was happening at the time um so this was made in 2019 but um, this was a response to the zero tolerance policy that the Trump administration had implemented. Um, everybody knows it as, um, oh, that they're like ripping families apart in the border and that they're incarcerating families and deliberately separating families to deter them from migrating into the United States. Um, and so for me, you know, at the time I was like, I need to kind of, I need to respond to something, right? Because at that time it was like, perhaps no, um, you know, this is not deliberately happening to me, but I also had that uh, sort of child um, migration experience. And, and, and it was just something that like, I really just needed to respond to. Um, and so um, the way that these came about was uh, the monotypes are just pressure prints where I would just roll up um, ink that was mixed with soil, um, and I would just roll it across a large plexiglass. And I started to uh, press um, a combination of like uh, found garments or like backpacks, pants, things that were like scale to like uh, child size. Um, some of them, um, some of them were uh, like, like I think I, I had one, one or two pieces where they were like actual garments that, that I use when, when my family made that, um, that journey. And then some of them are just kind of like, there were outsourced pieces. Um, and so really all I did was I would um, deliberately just take those fabrics or those found uh, materials that I was using and press them on the glass and run them very carefully through the press. And so it's really talking about this, like, um, for me, I was thinking about like surveillance, um, thinking about like, uh, how do I represent a human being without deliberately like drawing them out, right? Some of the pieces that I have in the in the show are like I, you know, I drew out my mom and my dad. I drew like certain figures, but like how do you talk about um, sort of like the actual 
uh, human presence without necessarily like depicting them, right? Um, and so uh, thinking about, yeah, like surveilling, surveillance and tracking, thinking about uh, the life's loss. And so some of them are very carefully like laid out so that they look like they've been perhaps um, abandoned or they're just kind of, so, so um, and the, the paper gallons on the bottom, they're uh, kind of like what I mentioned earlier, they were, um, I took my uh, DACA application and I just printed them on a uh, Tycozo. So I cut out the Tycozo into like an eight and a half by 11 paper size. So I could very carefully run them through um, the printer and the printer that I was using, it would like scrunch up the Cozo when I was running it through. So I started stapling it onto like another piece of paper and then running it through to make it like tougher. And, but then from there, I just started to like, um, very much like paper mache started using like milk jugs to like sculpt these objects, but very carefully, again, like thinking about printmaking in the sense, like what is, how am I gonna layer this up to not only physically like hold up, like so that it doesn't like smush on itself, but then also like what, what kind of information am I really trying to share here, right? Because a lot of the, what, what I was using is my immigration documents. And so um, I definitely, did, uh, you know, I, I didn't wanna shy away from, from the fact of like what they were. And, but at the same time, kind of like what Erica was saying, it's like a very vulnerable thing where it's like visibility has a double-edged sword where, where you wanna talk about these things that you care about and that are impacting your life and your community as a whole. And yet at the same time, like how much information do you really wanna put out there that's gonna put you in danger and others around you? Um, but the, uh, the kind of like the little close-up image that you see here, uh, that's, you know, the little, the little uh, passport photo or mugshot that we have to, uh, submit uh, every single time. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Juana. Um, I love that you use your doc applications. I really feel you there. And I just thought that, you know, the, the archival effect of like using an actual, your own history or something and you know, like applying it onto um, the history of others becomes you know this kind of universal message mm -hmm. um and in parallel to also how i use um screen printing monotypes xerography chalk transfers very much um a, a tracing of history um uh i also love the effect of printmaking um as a texture with drawing or other wet mediums um and uh it's not featured in these four series but um, in some of my other Wrong Woman series, I heavily use um, screen printing monotypes and sort of these uh, traditional uh, printmaking effects to um, speak to like voyeurism also, um, a, a notion of like past and present. And I love um, still creating that very arduous, um, like one layer, it looks as if it's printed, but you really look at it and you question like, which is print, which is drawn. Um, and all of it is, you know, uh, painstakingly just applied to one surface, basically. I still love that um, effect, I guess, because I come from such a drawing background, but I hope I answered your question. Thank you. So I have just a couple more questions ready. I wanted to just remind those watching from home, now would be a great time to start putting any questions that you might have in the Q&A. It could be about processes, about stories behind some of the works that we've been showing. Anything else you'd like to hear from these artists, any observations you'd like to share can go in the chat. Um, a question that I have for all of you uh, while we wait for some audience questions to trickle in, um, I'd love to hear from each of you a bit about how this exhibition has affected your perception of your work. So now that you've seen your work in the context of this group exhibition and this framework that Carmen has applied, um, has your understanding of your own practice changed at all? Or um, if so, how? Or what have you gotten out of conversations with this group? that you are carrying forward in your practice from here out? Anyone can start, jump on in. Or I'll call on someone. Um, well, I, well, go ahead, Hannah. Oh, no, no, go you ahead. go ahead, Erica. Um, I just wanted to say that I feel so inspired by everybody. Um, 
and I would love to try different printmaking techniques. Um, I also love, love that we took a field trip um, during our cohort meeting and, you know, living in New York, I have now access to these amazing print shops that I didn't know existed before. Um, and every part of this program was just very fruitful and rewarding and um, just everlasting um, and impactful. Um, even the artist talks, the panel, um, I think they all had something to give, absolutely. Yeah, I think for me, you know, it kind of, you know, of course, like this, this larger theme that we all had to respond to, I think that, um, you know, it really, kind of like what Erica said, I feel really inspired because everybody's playing with material and um, using printmaking to, to fuel their ideas in such like interesting ways, whether that's like uh, Jacqueline just, you know, being very playful <laughs> with the risograph uh, machine and just kind of pushing the limits to, to what that um, machine can do versus like with, you know, we, I think we were all amazed when uh, we all were, Nina was like, yeah, it's made out of like three planks of wood and I'm just using what I have accessible in, in the home or the place that I was in physically and just re literally responding to the materials around me and seeing what I can do with them. And then, you know, kind of also too with like Erica where, where Erica, Erica speaks to like this larger idea of just really, really responding to what's happening um, in, in this state of like meditation and being okay with like not necessarily knowing what the outcome is going to be, but just working with the, with being present in, in the practice of, of, of what you're doing. And, um, and so for me, I, I've just found a larger appreciation of, of the limits that I don't think there is limits in print. It's just a matter of like what everybody brings um, to it. Uh, I like that everybody's really playful with the material, but then also just like um, everybody had different sort of like perspectives of, of like my work. Um, you know, of course, like, you know, Erico, I think Erico and I spoke a lot about my work because we both have the experience of being documented. Um, and then I think Julia, like I saw Julia, like look, working at, looking at my artwork um, one of those days and, and she was just like looking at the one that had like my, mo my mom and my whole family in there. And she was just like, I really respond to this and we had a long conversation about it. And so, um, I don't know, I think it's been very fruitful and just, of course, like seeing how everybody works material, talking about the concepts, but really just um, being in a group of artists who are just, we're all like really big nerds and just excited to just be there and geek out of course about concept, but materials and, and, and um, I don't know. I also had never been to New York before. So, um, you know, being, being, of course, like being able to physically go there, but, but just meeting new people, I think for me was, has been the most fruitful. I find it really interesting to see where people get their grains of inspiration and, um, and then the sort of, um, found imagery. Like when I, Juana, I really respond very much to your big installation. I just, when I look at it, I, I, I get all teary because I feel that sort of, um, I, I, I think I, I see like children's clothing in the mud and I see what, what, um, and I see the, the water, the gallons of water left out. And I think of things left behind and I think about, journeys and and um and moving and things left behind and so much of what i do is about things left behind is like about mm -hmm. this. and um so how how the material uh the found the objects that we work with like the print of of your body erico and and the the, the and the images that we pull from our background all are all these seeds of inspiration but and and how we then take these uh, objects, these these uh, bits of printed uh, 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 drawings, and and I I see like I see Jacqueline that like I see that big that big uh, dream house as a I did a whole bunch of dream houses too by the way, I see it as like a sandcastle with tunnels, right? Yeah. You know how in the, making a sandcastle the most fun is making the tunnels mm -hmm. and. So for me to be able to talk to a bunch of people and have us all be on the same level of, of sharing this and try to understand people's seeds and, and germs of inspiration as well as the as well as the the materials that we the sort of seeds and germs of materials that we bring to it, 
that I found really um, interesting and shed a different kind of light on myself and my own process because I'd never, I just do it. I don't think about it. And, and to be able to see it through your eyes as I'm seeing your work through mine. Yeah, um, I think just I'll echo what, you know, others have said about just being like inspired by the work in the group. I, I had, um, when I, when I started um, Riso, I had this background in printmaking, but I had sort of con gone away largely from printmaking for a while. Um, and, and, um, and the printmaking I had done, I, I, I used to do like these really large scale wood blocks and, um, um, and intaglio prints. And, and when I was like looking at everyone and learning about everyone's work and get it, and we're like talking about the, like, the really geeky technical stuff. I was like, oh yeah, I need to, I need to start to like, I need to make a wood, a woodcut again. I need to make, a, you know, oh, I need to, um, looking at what Juana did with those, um, with those milk jugs, um, which can, the water jugs rather, like, which conceptually is just like heartbreaking, but also technically was, um, was just like uh, this amazing transformation of material um, was really inspiring as well. And um, and then Erico like thinking about, oh, using her body to make a print. Um, and then I really responded in particular to like this idea of like, you use your body to make the print and then you think about and then you spend time and meditate and think about the forms that you can like bring out from that. Um, and I found that like whole idea really, um, yeah, just just really amazing and inspiring. And that's, yeah, just the, the conversations that we've all been having have been amazing, great, so. Um, I've got a question here. Um... For Nina, how big is your archive of house images and how do you decide what images to use for your prints? Oh, I think you're muted again, Nina. Um, it, it's pretty big. I did a whole bunch of um, back in, uh, during the uh, mortgage crisis. I did a whole bunch of uh, 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 foreclosed and bank owned properties. And then um, I did a whole bunch of just uh, houses in, in Brooklyn. And uh, I, so I have lots and lots of houses. And how do I decide? I have on, on my computer, I have this great file. And I go through, I go through, um, I, I spend lots of time uh, uh, looking at real estate ads. And they're so, they tell you so much. And if I, if somebody mentions a, a town or something that I don't know, I'll look up houses in that town and I'll be able to find out so much about the town. I'll be able to find out about, you know, the, just the different neighborhoods and, and the different interests of the people. And just by looking at like all the, you know, the range of prices and <laughs> of the real estate ads, and and just and what and what how people are living and and the, the but anyway I have this enormous uh, collection. I I are we I, talking like hundreds thousands? Uh, maybe close to a thousand. Yeah, I have some really good ones. If anybody ever wants to sit down and look at them, I'll, I'm that happy like to show you. Pretty great. And I I just I I don't know how I choose them. I don't just go and choose them. I I I spend days just looking through things and saving things. And then when I decide I'm going to go do something, I I have an idea and I'll I'll look for something. And it sometimes it's two houses put together. And sometimes it's it's just one. And and sometimes I really change them a lot. And sometimes I hardly change them at all. 
You know, I've, I've really been responding in your work to the way that you're using houses as, um, as stand-ins for people. And this is something that um, a few other of you have talked about, about imagery representing people. So like the houses are like the, the a constant character and they're responding to all these different um, factors in the environment. And Juana, you were also talking about how to use clothing and how to represent people without them being there. Um, I'm, I guess I'm just curious about what it is, um, if you have any thoughts about why um, the actual like human figure is not showing up in your work, or if there's a reason that you that you avoid it, or if there's something that's maybe like more interesting to you about sort of working around it in your prints, and that is open to anyone here. The human figure does show up in my work, just not in this particular group. group. Yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And I do think of the houses as port portraits. And I think of them, I do think of them as characters and people. And, um, and I, and so I choose to do the portrait of the house. And sometimes there are people in, in, in front of it. And they're not really who the portrait is of. Um, and I don't know why. I guess um, we're, we're used to seeing things in people and judging things in people in a certain kind of way. So if you do a portrait of a person, it comes with a lot of uh, preconceived notions. And I think people have a lot more just, um, I, I think people understand about homes that, that they have a lot of feeling and people put a lot of feeling into their homes and they represent people that way. And I guess people sometimes think that I'm being nostalgic or 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 or, or sentimental, and um, I don't think I I don't feel that way about them. I don't know want, and I don't intend to have people have preconceived notions about the homes, like what they mean or oh this is some, you know this kind of person would live you know that's kind of why I I use them because they. They 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 tell a story without without having you don't I don't I don't have a well and notion of them the way that you're bringing them in you're also removing the the identifying information if you had it to begin with that's not presented as part of the work that people are seeing in the gallery space yeah um on returning to this idea of, of home and the people who are in them and the what makes a home. Um, I've got two questions here. Um, one from Julia, fellow cohort member, um, and um, another from the audience about families. Um, one is, um, Erica, you mentioned earlier that your dad is an artist. Um, and so the question is, do any other artists here come from families of artists? And then also, um, Julia asked a question about, um, Jacqueline, you mentioned that uh, your child's imagination um, influences a lot of what you're doing with your quilted sculptures. So how has being a parent impacted your understanding of your creative process? So in either direction, sort of going back, going forward, how does family play a role in your work? which we've, we've touched on a lot here. Yeah. So if there's any additional thoughts that are coming out about that. Yeah, I can start just, I mean, yeah, having having my daughter Poppy like completely changed my work. It, it changed the way I work um, in that I work in this like um, really modular way. Um, um, because that allows me to like do work at home and now I have I do have a separate studio it allows me to like work back and forth in that way but then also like just yeah the idea of play 
uh, with with her has has totally changed things. I get inspiration from um, and over the years have 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 gotten inspiration from things that she um, works with. Um, like I think about uh, like tangrams, those um, those like sets of blocks shapes that you use to like make different uh, make different shapes, right? Um, and um, you know we've you know uh, during the pandemic there was a lot of making of work together, and there was a period of time when we were you know, all in lockdown in our small apartment in Brooklyn. And I was really limited to her art supplies, which we had for her as a four-year-old. And so I was making all these things with puffy paints, with like these fluorescent colored puffy paints, which then like totally impacted my whole palette. Um, and eventually those things that these these little like squares that I was making with these puffy paints um, ended up becoming scanned and becoming these like becoming they're they're now like Risa printed you know they've they've become part of the the um, system of patterns that I have um, but then yeah like just watch with the with that sense of imagination with with um watching how how you know an object can just become magical um and transform into something else um that is often like like trying to find the magic in the in the work um that has become a big part of my of my work trying to find find a way to have like to have it be a space where or a you know an object that could that can activate magic in a way um and activate play um that's that that's that's central to the work I make so Jacqueline um have you ever allowed your um your daughter to activate your pieces um, cause you talked about like this idea, like how, especially like, I think everybody keeps talking about the castle because, because of those holes and because of its inorganic sort of shape, I feel like it lends to like this possibility of like shape shifting itself. And yeah. so like, and so like, I mean, cause I know these are, some of these are printed on like, you said Japanese paper and then you yeah. stuff them and they're very delicately like put together, but like. I mean, it looks like you, the way that you construct them, it seems like they're really strong. And so for me, I'm like, just, you know, allowing yourself to just hand it over and say, go for it and see what happens. Um, do you think that's something that, that it is, it's something I think about more and, doing? yeah, that's something I think about more and more, um, just as like, um, you know, like I, and, and paper, I think paper is really strong. And for me, these are constructed of the, every work is unique, but um, they are constructed from things that are multiples. And I try not to be precious about the materials, right? And so, you know, hand, like I do give materials to her all the time and we have like sewn different things together. Her stuffed animals have little backpacks made from some of these prints and things um, that, that, you know, um uh or one ha one has become a you know a sack that she like put at the end of a stick so she could carry carry mm -hmm. things with um so some of that is happening but I think that I've been thinking particularly as I made the dream house more and more about how how that can happen um and to like give her sometimes you know the thing is kids are like it's like you forget how to be an artist um some at some point right kid all kids are like amazing artists and then and then you're just trying to like remember how to do that again um and so sometimes like I will I will have like we will be drawing together and I'll look at what she did and I'm like oh that's so much 
that's so much better than mine. So I'm going to, and, and I, and I copy it. So I'm like, I'm going to, co- I'm going to copy th- that. Um, so, or, or I'll give her one of my prints and then she does a drawing on top of it in response. Um, so it, it's happening, although that it's not necessarily been like, uh, an official part of, of, of my work or like, a, but, uh, I think it, it, it may, it may become that. So, yeah. Like make a giant paper airplane. Yeah. Just yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, 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 just... or like a, a fort. Like mm-hmm. a... Yeah. 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 And I mean, I think I've been like thinking about, um, you know, I, because I work modularly, like, I think I've been like thinking and I've been working into the three-dimensional, I've been also thinking about like paper folding things. And I used to do these like origami projects and stuff. And so, which were also, you know, playful. Um, And so I've been thinking about, well, how can I take those and make them into multiples that we would then use that, that someone could use as building blocks and and they become a playful thing too so can I ask you about the fringe on the one? Oh, um <laughs> just <laughs> the fringe can't i finish i think i finished that print on the december 31st of whatever the year it was made was it was like my final work and i just um you know i play i think it's it's called notions because and it was it for a while the working title was pocket square because it has this like little square it has a little pocket with a with a handkerchief cut printed handkerchief out of it but um it just didn't look quite finished and then i um notions is just this like thing when you're do making like crafts, like uh, textile crafts. Um, you can buy notions and they're like, it could be like fringe or like little pom-pom things or whatever. And so I just, I just kind of, I thought this needs, I don't know, this needs some print, this, 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 this is it. It was my party print. It was my New Year's Eve print. I needed a little fringe, right? <laughs> so sometimes it's something as simple as that. And then, um, and also just like, it's on the, I don't know, uh, fringe as like, it's on the fringe. It's like, uh, like a threat, like kind of between things. Um, but yeah, but I painted, I, I just painted the um, painted this paper with fluorescent pink gouache, and then I started to cut it to create my own fringe, and then I sewed that um, to the to the bottom to finish the work. Um, and it's also like a nod to these, like that's a thing that you see a lot in these weavings and text, like craft textiles and stuff. And so it's sort of this nod to that it's kind of, for me, it's kind of jokey, but yeah, so. Right, not nod to the wovenness. Of yeah. It. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just wanted to add, Jacqueline, I love your color palette. I was curious, like, how you choose your color palette and just the different textual elements, um, and I love that you collaborate with your child. I think that's the influence you're putting on her as well. I, I think she's going to become quite the artist, perhaps already working with you and these amazing um, scale of works, but specifically with your color palette, how do you choose your color palette or does that organically form? Yeah, um, so um, so with the risograph, you, you can't mix, you don't mix colors like the way you would mix paint, right? Colors are mixed through, um, through layering, right? So some of my palette ends up being sort of determined by the colors that I have available. Um, I have 10 or I have nine colors plus black, right? So um, available to me, I don't have like say any purple, but you'll see a lot of purple in my work because that's, that's a layering situation. I also am kind of obsessed with fluorescence and I've like made it a point to 
um, to seek out fluorescence. So the fluorescent pink is sort of this classic uh, risograph color, and you'll see a lot pink and blue. That's like a your classic riso. Um, and so that's that's a lot of like the the fringe piece notions. That a lot of that is sort of a nod to that to that like classic riso um, palette, but um the some of the other fluorescents that I use aren't available in the U.S. and so I had to go through this crazy bartering system with different print shops in like Berlin and the UK in order to in order to get <laughs> to get the the colors um so they they're true fluorescents they glow they glow under a black light um and so I love that sort of like hidden aspect that's that's there too um uh, that, that, um, that, that's a part of work and that's important to me. And so that's part of, that's part of how that palette has developed. We'll have to, uh, work on getting a black light installed yeah. in the gallery or in some other future iteration of these installations. Yeah. Um, I, I hate to interrupt, but I think we are at the end of our time together today. I hope you're all taking notes on, um, things that you're going to be doing with your work. It sounds like a lot of great ideas have come up. Um, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Juana, Nina, Jacqueline, and Erico for joining us, especially to Jacqueline for joining us on her birthday um, and for sharing such a thoughtful conversation tonight. Um, you can see their work along with four other artists, Aaron Coleman, Julia Curran, Lois Harada, and Farah Muhammad in New Voices on Transformation at Print Center New York through August 25th. Uh, you can plan a visit, explore the artists, and learn more about our programs online at printcenternewyork.org. Um, thanks also to my colleague Emma, who's behind the scenes tonight helping run the program, and thank you to everyone at home for joining us. Um, we're going to be hosting another artist conversation in conjunction with On Transformation scheduled on the evening of July 26th, and that will be moderated by the show's curator, Carmen Ermo. You can register for that on our website. We also have upcoming, uh, if you're itching to make some prints yourself, a hands-on workshop uh, in late August, uh, which will be led by Nina Jordan, who's here with us tonight, and Farah Muhammad. Uh, registration for that event will open on August 1st and again can be found on our website. If you'd like to hear more about the works in the show, uh, we invite you to download the Bloomberg Connects app to listen to audio guides from the artists themselves and that's accessible through the QR code on your screen now. Finally, if you're interested in new voices, um, you should keep an eye out for the application for the 2024 exhibition, which will be available later this summer. You can follow us at Print Center New York on Instagram or subscribe to our newsletter for the most up-to-date information about that. And uh, please, if you could fill out our survey, it'll open automatically in your browser when you exit. So thank you so much for joining us and tuning into this conversation tonight. And from all of us at Print Center New York, I hope you have a great night. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. you.